वेलकम चिप्ति साहब इवन नॉट ऑट यू वेल सर नाउ या परफेक्ट ओ थैंक यू थैंक यू यू लुक यंग है पार्डन यू लुक यंग टुडे ओ थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच शांतनु इफ देयर इज अ कपल ऑफ मिनट्स आई वुड लाइक टू स्पीक श्योर 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 ओके थैंक यू Jodhi ma please note it yeah i have i have already I just had a talk with our president. I think he will join soon. Can as we can only see our faces over here, or some circles with some letters or icons. Uh, the entire screen appears as if professor saha is also joined has also joined the meeting the picture looks like that yeah this is a this really he, he was a regular member yeah yes i think he he missed only once or twice yes in the last uh, three years of this monthly lecture in fact i was talking to his wife uh, day before yesterday in fact she was saying that she was he was really he was really upset because he could not uh, really meet this time in rds in canada she was saying like that yeah. anyway he will be with us every day every moment yes and it's also heartening that uh, ovinavada is recovering yeah it's very very good news because everyone knows that it will start at 4 so people will start joining around that time so with everyone's permission we will start 5 minutes past 4 i think that's uh, yeah if that is fine yeah yeah yeah, yeah. perfect i hope uh, um our speaker will agree to that yeah uh, yes
Jyotirma is the youth working? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Madam Shaha is with us now. I could see that she has joined. Okay, very good. And I think, uh, and I could, I can also see that uh, the younger brother of Professor Shaha is also here. Yes, Mr. Ratan Shaha. Yes. Yeah. So we will start in next two minutes, I think, at uh, five, part, 5 past 4, as we said. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So shall we start, uh, Shantanuda? Yeah, please go ahead. I think it is better to start. <clears throat> so uh, welcome everyone to the monthly SGT SGI e talk. And today is a very special day on which we organize Professor Dilip Shaha Memorial Talk. I extend warm welcome to uh, all the participants, all the members of the group, as well as I extend special welcome to the uh, family members of Professor Shaha. And uh, uh, this occasion has been graced by uh, Mrs. Shaha and um, 
uh, Mr. Rotan Shah, who is the younger brother of. My problem, or can everyone else listen to him? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Sir, I think, sir. I think sir was speaking to uh, someone else. Okay. 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 All right. So uh, a, a very well warm welcome to the uh, family members of Professor Shaha as well. So the Structural Geology and Tectonic Studies Group deeply mourns the passing of Professor Dilip Shaha. Professor Shaha, a renowned structural geologist who was an active member of this group. We have lost not only a great scientist, but a treasured teacher, mentor, friend, and a valued colleague. He will always be remembered for his humble nature and pleasing personality, together with his extraordinary contribution in the field of geosciences. Professor Shaha earned his BSc and MSc degree from Presidency College and Calcutta University, respectively, being first plus first in both the occasions. He earned his PhD from London University in 1984 and DIC in Structural Geology from Imperial College London in the same year. He joined Jogomaya Devi College in Calcutta as a lecturer in 1980 and a lecturer in the Indian, Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta in 1984. He continued working there till his retirement and he retired as a professor uh, HAG and then after his retirement also, he continued working there. He was awarded with many honors during his glorious career. National Mineral Award, H.C. Dasgupta Memorial Medal, CVCP Award, UK, State Scholar, Calcutta University Gold Medal, Edward Scholar, Sai India Gold Medal, to name a few. Uh, Professor Shaha also has recently received the Promothanath Bose Memorial Award in 2022, awarded by the Asiatic Society. Professor Shaha has recently published a book, uh, namely Basics of Geological Maps and Interpretation from the Geological Society of India. This low-cost book will be a great asset to the undergraduate students studying structural geology in India. He has published more than 50 papers and book chapters in reputed international journals. Professor Shaha leaves behind his wife, daughter, several students, mentees like us. So we fondly remember his interactions at numerous occasions in this forum. But although we mourn his passing, but today we celebrate his contribution, his immense contribution uh, in the Indian uh, arena of geosciences. So with that, I would request Professor Dhruva Mukhopadhyay to chair this very special meeting. Uh, and I would request Professor Dhruva Mukhopadhyay to say a few words. Sir. Professor Mukhopadhyay. Just give him a call. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just turn. Having a problem with his audio, I think. Yes, uh, I think, sir. Cannot hear. Uh, sir, could you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Seems there is a, but he could hear us before. Just a minute. Let me see whether he keep on. Yeah. Yes, sir. Shunta bachan. Apni shunta bachan marga. Ah. Akam to apna ke or or dark chillo. Jo is a baller chunno. Kinda ap. Now, now we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Huh? 
Perfect. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. So I. So let me let me uh, let me talk. Yeah. Or Jyotin Ma has said to chair the session and to say a few words about the contribution of Professor Shah and your interaction with him. Okay. Okay. Professor Dilip Shah has uh, passing away. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Sir. Can you can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, sir. Sir, yes. you can also yes. uh, uh, you know unlock your camera so that. Professor Dilip Shah has passing away is a great shock for me personally, and I am sure it is for the entire geological community. Uh, I had a very I knew Dilip Shah for a long time. I still recall the days when he first joined as a young undergraduate student at the Presidency College. Dilip Shah's school education was uh, in a small from a small town school, not very well known school. So, but when he came, I was astounded by his intellectual ability, by his power of expression, and his command over the English language. His all his writings, even at this very young age was marked by clarity of conception and lucidity of expression. And all his publications also bear this mark. See, he was a brilliant student. As I said in another of his memorial meetings in honor of Dilip Shah, that in every batch, there are some good students and some not so very good students. But Dilip Shah was not only the best in his class, but he was a legendary student. In the history of any institutions, some students make their mark so much that they are remembered for long, even after they have passed out of the college. Dilip Shah was one such student. And for many years, his juniors used to talk about his intellectual ability and his scoring record marks. And he was the Edward Scholar. Edward Scholar means that he got the highest marks among the honor students belonging to all subjects. Please, chemistry, humanities, and science subjects. So his marks was the highest in the BSc. And the same was true also in the MSc class. So he was not only a brilliant student, but he was intellectually one of the brightest that I have come across. And I have great respect for him as a scientist, as a human being. He exuded modesty. I have never seen him talking about himself or about how good his work is. And he, he was never used to project himself as a very brilliant scientist. And this endeared him to all his colleagues and his students. I have two regrets about Dilip Shah. One is Dilip Shah 
did not have the opportunity to teach at one of the major teaching institutions teaching geology in India. He was a state scholar, state scholar from the government of West Bengal. And the conditions of a state scholar is that they have to serve the government of, for five years after they come back. So there are several state scholars before him also. And the usual custom was that a state scholar would find his birth at the presidency college. But for some strange reasons, Dilip was not offered a job at the presidency college. So he had to search for a job. And I believe for a few months or maybe uh, for several months, he was teaching at Jomal Devi College or Ashutosh College till he got a position at the Indian Statistical Institute. He, his uh, research at uh, Indian Statistical Institute was of a very high standard, but he could not produce the many students that he could have, he could not build up a school of research at a leading institute in, uh, in India. So this is one regret that I have about him. And the second regret is that he had still many things to give to science and to the society. He was at the height of his intellectual prowess. His book on structural geology has just come out and we are expecting that he could, he write, he could write so well and we are expecting that he would write several books in his subject of specialization. So we, Dilip's passing away is a great personal loss from me and it is a great loss for the geoscientific community of India. So I pay my deepest respect to Professor Dilip Shah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now, may I request Dr. Shanta Saha, who is uh, also the wife of uh, Professor Dilip Shaha, so to say a few words. Ma'am, if it is fine with you. Uh, I think uh, Professor Shantanu Bose is trying to. Yeah, uh, Jodhima, please check whether she is un she has unmuted herself. Uh, no, she has not. Okay, so I think you need to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself.
ओके सो यू कैन यू कैन जस्ट स्पीक आई एम यू कैन स्पीक ओवर दिस फोन एंड एवरीबॉडी विल हियर दैट ओके ओके हॉटकेल आई आई वेरी मच ग्रेटफुल टू यू दैट I'm learning from you people that many things about my husband what I didn't know even. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, madam, for your uh, for uh, saying few words uh, in this occasion. Over to Jatin Ma. uh thank you very much ma'am i i uh, we we can we can completely understand your your mental condition now i think we have uh, duti shah as well if i am not mistaking uh she must be the daughter of uh, professor shah uh, yes uh, okay. if you don't mind i'd like to say a few yes, words yes absolutely yeah. please duti go ahead yeah uh, so first of all i would like to uh, thank all the organizers for arranging this meeting I think it's a very apt way to honor his memory. I'm sure all of you who have known him in either a professional or a personal capacity have your own fond memories of him. And one thing I have learned from my father and the way he conducted himself in his professional life is that you have to let your work speak for you. Uh he was someone who did not like to talk much about his achievements. but rather focused all his energy on the work he loved and that is something i think all his students and i as his daughter have been inspired by uh my father lived his life very humbly without any showmanship and he followed those principles in both his personal life and professional career uh therefore i believe he would want his legacy to be the same and i believe his memory will live on through his work and through the work of all his peers colleagues friends and students thank you thank you very much duti that was really thoughtful uh may i also request mr ratan saha uh his younger brother professor shaha's younger brother to say a few words respected chairperson members of structural geology and tectonic studies group of india and learned audience uh i don't want to say much as uh, my elder brother philips daughter already told what uh, i just want to thank you and express our heart deep gratitude and Regards to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shah. Uh, I think uh, Professor Shantanu Bose has uh, some messages that were delivered to him by uh, some of the eminent scientists of India, and uh, I would request Professor Bose to read those out as well as uh, express his feeling uh, on this occasion. Thank you, Jyotin Ma. Uh, in fact, uh, I was introduced to Professor Shah uh, at University of Calcutta in a meeting of Geological Society in Mining and Metallurgy, Geological Mining and Metallurgical Society of India. And there, uh, Professor Shah has been has been an editor for more than two decades for the for the journal. And I saw him working uh, on a on a on a On a on a paper, so meticulously, so meticulously that really it is very difficult for every one of us. So he 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 he, he starts working on a paper uh, uh, from word to punctuation to everything, and in fact, in fact, even after even after review, he sends back. He used to send back. Uh, the power papers uh, for this punctuation corrections and all so that he wants everything should be grammatically as professor mukhopadhyay has said that grammatically correct completely in the in the public published uh, paper 
so uh, i i i really i have been known for him for last uh, 12 years or so so but uh, i i met him so frequently in this uh, meeting and all particularly in calcutta university and i'll be missing him a lot because he he gave me many suggestions in my career as well and in fact in some scientific aspects also i'll remember him uh, as long as i'll be here in geology well i pay uh, my deepest regards deepest sympathy to his uh, uh, family members and i hope uh, we all will have to come out of this shock quickly so that we can we can we can really carry forward his work with uh, with with more even more zeal and more pride thank you this is from my side and i received <clears throat> a couple of messages that they have uh, asked me to read out during this meet uh, during this meeting one is from professor deepak sivastav Uh, he, he was a professor and he, i think he is still in professor of iit roorkee so he is now busy in uh, meeting the acrb meeting and he asked me to please read out this message and he said i was introduced to his this name dr dilip shah through a discussion and reply in 1985 It was in the meeting of structural geologists at Jadavpur University in October 1993 where I met him in person. In no time we became good friends and shared many thoughts together. Our last meeting was in HKT October 2015. Here I also got an opportunity to share the post conference field trip across the garwal himalaya with him his outcrop observations and interpretations were truly absorbing most certainly dr dilip shah was the most outstanding and most complete structural geologist of our generation of late he made monumental contribution to our understanding of kadappa basin in saying goodbye to him this this soon feels immensely wrong thank you this was a message from professor deepak sivastav and uh, in fact today early, very early morning of uh, kolkata uh, i received a message from professor sudipta shangupta uh, she, she is currently uh, in usa and she said that she is so sad that she cannot join direct on live because it is very early morning now in us so she also sent a small message to read it out here she said it was indeed a shock for me to learn about that dilip is no more i first met him nearly 40 years ago when he was a young researcher just returned from uk after his doctoral study at the imperial college gradually he became one of the finest structural geologists of india whose valuable contribution on the subject enriched our knowledge on the precambrian structures he was also an important member of our structural geology group and always took part in all of our activities he will be greatly missed by all of us i offer my deepest sympathy to his wife and family thank you so this is from my side jyotima thank you very much professor bose may i now request uh, uh, dr shubhrato ghosh uh, to say a few words from government college durgapur you are you are muted Dr. Ghosh, you are muted. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I am not. I am not a doctor yet. I am an associate professor of Durgapur Government College, uh, in West Bengal. Now, uh, Professor Dilip Shah was formerly uh, called by us as Dilip Da, as is the 
usual custom in West Bengal for among the Bengalis. Uh, he was a senior to us by seven years. Um, as you already mentioned, Jyotima uh, already mentioned that, that um, Dilipka passed his BSc in 1974 and MSc in 1976. But in those times, the Calcutta University had a great time lag, almost four years. So theoretically, one may pass in 1974, but practically the mark sheet would come to his or her hand in 1978, something like that. Uh, when uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay uh, gave a very nice introduction about Dilipta, he was our role model. When we used to study at Presidency College Geology Department, we were uh, impressed by the stories of Dilipta. And I just want to share just a few three or four uh, uh, occasions or instances. Uh, I uh, entered the Science College Geology Department in 1978. Around that year, either it may be 77 to 79, something like that, there was a student-run journal. It is still being published called Who Vita. Mainly students are encouraged to uh, publish uh, their findings, uh, study results, MSc dissertation works, etc. Of course, teachers also publish uh, important articles there. So in that issue, it was an annual publication once in a year. Dilipda wrote about a biological um, topic. The title of that uh, article was Evolution Vis-a-vis Mutation. I mentioned this just to uh, highlight the versatility that Dilipta had. Later on, in 1982-83, when I was the secretary of Geological Institute, there was the association or a uh, uh, body, a student body like, uh, like that in Geology Department of Presidency, University of College at that time. It is called Geological Institute of Presidency College. And it is uh, run mainly by students. Of course, the uh, departmental teachers give their suggestions. And they do the monitoring, advice, everything very actively. So when I was the secretary of that institute in 1982-83 session, Dilipda was at Imperial College London doing his PhD with uh, Professor Janet Watson. So I requested him to give an article for publishing again in Kuvita. Uh, and he readily accepted uh, so that, that, that shows his humility, that shows his love towards uh, the students of geology. Doesn't matter how young or how old uh, the, the student is. So he readily accepted that invitation and uh, sent an article. And it was on roughly computer applications in geology. Now, what happened? After the article came, it was shown to our uh, teachers, departmental teachers. They thought it was, it was of so high quality that it should be published in a much more reputed standard journal than the student run Bhubita. So uh, that again shows the, the quality and the uh, versatility. Uh, he was later to be, or at that time, he was being specialized in structural geology, tectonics. Uh, now, uh, I know about Dilipta, and I always believed him to be my role model uh, in, our, in my uh, student life and now also. There was a big reason for that. Dilipta, during his undergraduate and postgraduate studies, used to stay in a Ramakrishna Mission hostel in a place called Belghoria in Kolkata. My younger brother used to be an F boarder of that hostel at the same time. Again, uh, due to that time lag, uh, it was possible. My younger brother was a student of class 12. He is now a neurologist in USA. So I got, uh, got to hear many stories from my brother, Devo Broto. Vivekta was a good cricketer. 
it was very difficult to get him out. The bowlers and fielders in field, they would be tired to get him out. Although he was not a flamboyant run getter, but it was like a walk. So it again shows the kind of patience or cool headedness that uh, as a person with the hat. Uh, he was a great well wisher, but many uh, godly persons, whoever they meet and get acquainted, they become well wisher to them. So uh, many, many, I believe many, many people are there for whom Vilita was a great well wisher. Today, uh, I should not take much more time. My I respect, deep uh, homage is shown to Dilipta, to his memory. And wherever you are, Dilipta, bless us, show us our path of progress. My deepest condolence to the family members, Bodhi, Ratan, Duti, her husband, and other friends and uh, uh, well of Dilipta. And my deepest uh, congratulations and heartiest congratulations to, to the organizers of SGTSGI for this meeting. This is a very timely and very relevant thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are muted, Jotinmar. May I now request Professor Shetty to say a few words, please? Uh, Sorry, you are all muted. Friends, I feel sorry that we are missing Professor Dilip Saha today, who has been a very regular and uh, constant listener and active participant in many of our discussions during our monthly talks. He has been one of my good friends. Our friendship started very long time back when he started his journey to Kadapa Basin via Hyderabad. He came and met me and we started our relationship since then. I was really shocked to know his passing away just because I heard him and I have seen him online during the book release, during his book release by the Geological Society of India. He has reviewed many of my papers, which have been published in Geological Society of India. He was also an examiner for some of my students, PhD students. He was, I found him a perfectionist and an excellent critic of the scientific aspects. I always find him a perfect gentleman, mild and very pleasant mannered person. I used to like him very much. We used to have personal discussions very frequently on personal phones. And I must also tell you that he has nominated me recently for an award which I have got it without my asking. This is how our relationship was there and I feel very much missing. I pray the Almighty to shower his richest blessings on the family, to bear the loss of him and may his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I request Professor Dilip Kumar Mukhopadhyay to say a few words? <clears throat> Professor Mukhopadhyay. Yes, uh, it's very difficult to say anything about uh, Dilip Shah who left us so suddenly. Suffice to say that he was a brilliant student, a brilliant researcher, a brilliant scientist, and also, I presume, a brilliant uh, teacher. I call him Dilip, not Dilipda, because we have the same name, Dilip, uh, because he was junior to me. And I came to know about him in early 70s when one of his classmates 
came and joined IIT Kharagpur, where I was a student also. And after that, uh, I'm working at IIT Rurki. I worked in IIT Rurki, so we did not meet very frequently. But I am aware of his uh, scientific contributions and his personality uh, and his persona. And I know about how meticulous he was and how perfectionist he was. And many people have already said about that. I would like to say just two things. One is that uh, he was a field structural geologist, field structural geologist, field work. That's what I emphasize. One of the fast disappearing breed in geology in general. And I would be missing him very severely because of his this quality that he would go and look in the field and interpret structures. So will be, those who believe in structural geology in the field would surely be missing him. <sighs> so I know him for a very, very long time, almost more than 45 years. And um, at this age, my age, only thing that I can say is a, a friend's untimely departure, a friend's untimely departure is a reminder, is a reminder that how fragile life is. We'll all miss Dilip Saha, all of us here who's present today. His uh, great loss that we have in geoscientific community in general and structural geology in particular would be difficult to fulfill. I pray to God Almighty that He gives enough strength to the family members who have lost much more than that you and I, but others have lost here. And I'm sure he must be enjoying Dilip's company up somewhere uh, in the sky or somewhere wherever the heaven is. With that, uh, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So now we open this forum for uh, any anyone who wants to speak about Professor Shah. You can please raise your hand and uh, you can take your thoughts. Okay, if not, I think we can have uh, we can have another go once the talk is uh, uh, over. So uh, this brings us to the uh, the technical talk that we have organized today. And uh, today uh, we have with us Professor Gautam Ghosh, and uh, he is also a PhD student of uh, Professor Shaha. So uh, Professor Ghosh has obtained his BSc and MSc degree in geology from Calcutta University. And after obtaining MSc degree in 1985, he joined the Indian Statistical Institute of Kolkata as a research scholar under the supervision of Professor Shaha, as I just said, and did his doctoral thesis from Calcutta University on unclassified mesoproterozoic sequences of Pranida Godavari Valley. Subsequently, he joined Durgapur Government College as a lecturer in 1989 and later shifted to Presidency College, Kolkata. And at present, he is working as a professor of geology in Presidency University, Kolkata. Uh, his research interest lies uh, on Precambrian crustal evolution and identification and quantification of crustal to grain scale deformation processes associated with tectonic uh, um, research for about 30 uh, tectonic events uh, from low to high grade metamorphic terrains. Uh, he has been engaged in teaching and research for about 35 years now and have supervised eight PhD students, have around 50 uh, research publications, um, have got um, funded projects from DST, BRNS, uh, CSIR, MOES, etc. 
with this brief introduction may i invite professor ghosh to deliver the talk uh, which is entitled as brittle ductile deformation and slip processes in fault zone rocks insights from nahan thrust and north almora thrust northwest himalaya india over to you professor ghosh uh jodin I, I i also request, i will also request uh, professor ghosh to speak a few words uh, about uh, our beloved professor saha before he starts his technical talk absolutely yes sir please uh, uh okay thank you uh, am i audible yes sir you are audible so at the beginning uh, i would like uh, like to add a few words about professor shah now sir is it I, possible to come clo closer to the mic or uh, yeah that might can help you, can you hear me now we can hear you but uh, slightly uh, it's not very loud okay uh, is it audible now yeah yes sir go ahead please yeah okay so uh, the sudden and untimely demise of professor shah is a loss uh, which is really very really hard to reconcile with and i am uh, grateful to this forum for giving me this opportunity and inviting me uh, to deliver the Professor Dilip Shah Memorial Lecture and in thus uh, to pay homage to my beloved teacher. We have already heard uh, many aspects of Dilip Shah and his illustrious career. So I would uh, like to add a few uh, which I have felt uh, as a student uh, under him. So Dr. Dilip Shah. I think is one of the leading structural geologists and stratigraphers in India, and a very fine field geologist at the same time. His research interests included structural geology and tectonics as well as precambrian stratigraphy, and he mostly worked in the Indian Procuratory basins. And some of the Indian cratons, like the Shingon craton and Vastal craton, also uh, we worked on the Himalayan origin. He always preferred a field geological approach, along with uh, geophysical studies and geochronological studies, in solving uh, geological problems. And together with his students and colleagues, he worked. Extensively in the Patrasi business of India, leading to a new tectonic framework for the Katakka basin and also about the correlation between the different Patrasi basins of India. Uh, also, he uh, did commendable work on Archean tectonics from the Shingon Teton, and his uh, research works uh, culminated in about nearly 70 publications in leading arts and science, as far as I remember. I would also like to add a few of my personal uh, experiences with Professor Shah. Uh, my relationship with Dr. Shah. Uh, lasted for nearly 40 years. It started in 1985 when I joined as a research scholar uh, under him to pursue my doctoral thesis. And he was at that time just joined uh, Indian Statistical Institute coming back from Imperial College. Initially, our bonding was that of a normal teacher student relationship. Uh, but over the years, it grew stronger and became of a more intimate relationship. It is not that we often met after my PhD and talked for a long time, but whenever uh, I called him, 
After long gaps over food, or meet him at some meeting or at conferences, he would always ask how he would return and went on to ask about the values of my wife and daughter. So in reply, I also started with sad poverty and he would also always respond with a smile and say, I am fine, Gautam. So to me, that became his signature words. So when I called him up in last degree to initiate a conversation, I was really shocked to hear for the first time that he is saying that I am not very good physically. I always really felt that mentally he was a very strong person and never expressed uh, openly or publicly about his any physical inabilities. Obviously, he was a very uh, he was a person who would not say much about himself. So the conversation rang up an alarm in my mind. I called him up again after some days and inquired about his health. And he said that the illness is still persisting. And then the things went really out of hand, which culminated in a sudden demise on the 18th of June. I always respected him as a teacher, and we continue to do that as my mentor and admired his scientific achievement his dedication and innate mental strength. As a student, I had, I can openly admit that I had the full access to get into his room and discuss any problem, whatever came to my mind. In fact, he was always very dark in me. And I think we remain as such. <clears throat> I feel he was a teacher unique in his ways. And we are very little, uh, those who have uh, lived with under him, we got the opportunity to be taught by him directly. So uh, he was a brilliant uh, teacher in that way. He would always try to persuade me to apply myself in solving problems. And he would not provide direct tools for solutions at any time. So as a student, I started to observe him keenly, how he how he's doing things and solving problems in the field as well as back in the laboratory and trying to adopt his style of working. And I think it immense it helped me immensely to grow as a co-worker, which I was also after previously for a brief period. He was always supportive and extended his full support whenever I needed. He was a really kind person, liked and respected by all. So his, uh, his sudden demise has profoundly struck all of us, his colleagues, students and family members. I deeply sympathize with them at his great loss and pray for my beloved teacher was active in work till his last day. I strongly feel that the best way to render tribute to Dr. Shah would be to commemorate his achievements and pursue his unfinished works on the potential so and art essays and the Archean Botanic Park of India. So with this uh, with this I will now uh, go on to the other part of uh, today's program, which is the uh, Professor Dinik Shah Memorial Lecture. So I will start uh, sharing the uh, screen. Is it visible to everybody? Yeah, it's good. Uh, yeah, okay. do that. Fine, perfect. So, right. 
So uh, today I will uh, talk upon, I have chosen a topic which is uh, between to between reptile deformation and sleep processes in cold zone rocks. I, I have deliberately chosen this topic because while doing PhD, uh, I worked under him on a topic which is very close to this, which is cold fault relations and previous development from the protrusive rocks of the planet of the Valley Valley. So, uh, so for this reason, I have uh, I have selected this topic so that I can discuss about the deformation processes from poison rocks, but not from uh, the Teton part, uh, but from the Himalayan part, where also we did some very commonly works in this area. So. Uh, Firstly, if we uh, look at uh, the fault zones, uh, you can see from this diagram, these are uh, diagrams for awareness letter then from Pasin and uh, Double Country. So these are uh, review papers. So what I want to uh, try to project here is that when we are looking at a fault from shadow cast to deeper cast, uh, there is a change in uh, lithotypes which we encounter, usually we encounter the gods brachia type of rocks in the shadow level and as we go deeper with the shift in deformation mechanism and deformation process, it gradually uh, goes to myelonide via the cataclysites and apart from uh, the rock types, uh, when you look at the individual minerals also, uh, with, uh, with the depth, the behavior of minerals also changes. Uh, we all know that that uh, quartz for quartz, it is about 300 degrees centigrade where the little ductile transition occurs. For example, it is at a slightly higher temperature and slightly greater depth. And if we uh, take calcite, uh, we will see dislocation tree features with a much higher uh, depth in calcite. Uh, I am deliberately uh, taking these three minerals because they are very common in uh, shallow crustal rocks and in the Himalayan rocks. And other than this, we, we will get uh, biotite, muscovite, chloride to clay minerals. And their occurrence also to be with depth and metamorphic pressure temperature depending. So I will, through my lecture, try to show uh, that uh, what type of deformation process and what type of mineral assemblies we are observing uh, at the two fault zones which I have chosen. And another very interesting uh, character of uh, shadow crust and faults is that uh, that usually the fault zone architects there, there is a fault core which is on, uh, on the two sides or in one side, there is a fault damage zone. So there could be a single core or there could be multiple cores. But usually the shadow crust and faults are associated with this type of cores and damage zones where different kinds of faults are occur. And as you all know, that faults are very really easy paths for fluid flow. So often, with fluid in rest, we see change in mineralogy and fault zone weakening, which is another new characteristic feature of fault zones. And uh, these are also again textbook features that uh, in the next side you can see that the classification of fault rocks by Simpson, uh, which is the basis for all the discussion on fault rocks. And we have the cataclysite series, we have the marinite series, and we have the fault gauss and fault brachias and the pseudotachylites. And while looking at shadow cluster falls, uh, we are uh, also getting different kinds of fractional planes or shear planes, and usually we uh, classify them after so and so as uh, Y shears or P and P dash shears which are synthetic R shears are also synthetic to the main shear boundary 
while r dash or p dash they will be antithetic to the Schwarz cells. So uh, while we will be discussing about the factors, we will uh, keep this uh, terminology. And uh, for break shear classification, I would like to show you here uh, the classification by Mott and Woodcock, which I followed. That uh, is it the factory break shear, which is the mosaic break shear, and the creative break shear with progressive uh, finding and grain rotation. We will progress from pattern to theory direction. So, uh, with this brief introduction about the quantum architecture and quantum blocks, I will now go straight to uh, the topic of my previous lecture that is in the Himalayan origin. So, this is the regional map of the Himalayan origin after in 2006. And uh, I had chosen two areas, one of which is this, uh, this small rectangle here in the Himachal Haryana states. Uh, and another one, this is from the very outer part of the Himalayan origin. And the other one is slightly from the deeper parts of the Himalayan origin, which is from the Almora field. So first I will discuss about the Nahan, uh, the fall box about the Nahan first zone and the deformation process. And then I will take up the uh, discussion on our So uh, Nahan thrust, it is occurring just uh, above the main Himalayan frontal thrust, which uh, separates the Himalayan origin, origin from the uh, Indo-Dangitic region. So it is occurring, Nahan thrust is occurring just uh, above the MFT. And it affects mostly the South Himalayan sequences, which is again bounded by the Northern Trust, the NFT, and the NBT. So, this is a uh, simplified map of the area, it is taken after Mr. and Mukhopalka. So, here you can see the position of the Nahan Trust above the NFT, and on the football of the Nahan Trust, which is uh, not, not historically different. Uh, we get neogene, we get uh, Sabhimala and Rocks on both sides, but on the football side we get the younger Shivali group of rocks, while in the hanging bar we get slightly older than neogene rocks. So this is the uh, this is the geological setting of the area. And this small rectangle is the area where I would mainly concentrate. Uh, which is very close to the town in Jor, uh, which is occurring in between uh, in between Kalka town and uh, Chandigarh town, Chandigarh city. So this is a, the geological map of this Nahan Trans zone, uh, and this river is the Koshala River. So uh, you can see from the map that uh, this Nahan thrust zone it is very really wide zone, about 150 meter, almost close to 150 meter, and in the angular side we are getting the dark rocks of the dark side formation, and in the football side we are getting shiolic uh, group of rocks, and the shiolic are younger uh, related to the older dark side formation as per stratigraphy. So this is the typical Ashwadic boulder beds, which are occurring on the football site. And uh, this is the alternate sandstone and argillaceous sandstone of the dark side formation, uh, which you can see in the hanging wall side of the Nam Charleston. When uh, we can look at the, uh, where the intact protonic you can see, but when within the fault zone the rock has entered its legs. And this is a sketch section depicting uh, the distribution of point rocks in the Nahan Trust zone. Uh, so you can see that we have a, uh, as per our observation, we have a single fault core at the central part, and significantly there are two damage zones uh, which are occurring on two sides of the fault core. And in the fault core, we are getting a zone which is dominated by fault gauges of different kinds, which are which we uh, which uh, 
They are classified as red, grey and black houses depending upon their color and also the phenological differences. And on both sides of this gauze zone there are dexia zones and followed by on two sides the fractured rock column. So this is the uh, scenario of the Mahantra zone. And if you look at the uh, out of scale, so uh, this is the thing of which I and showed you the scales uh, section. So the black gauze is occurring here and it is very thin. It is about one, uh, nearly one meter in thickness compared to the other gauzes which are much thicker. And these are the field photographs of the different uh, gauze sample. And the black gauze, gray gauze contact, this is also uh, decorated with slip inside, so which indicate that this is the principal slip surface within the Mahantras. And if you look under thin section of the protolith rocks, the sandstone and the argillaceous sandstone, uh, you can see that uh, in the argillaceous sandstone there is dominant mass increasing by the silicate proportion uh, compared to the uh, sandstone. And compared to the sandstone, the Argillaceous sandstone is little foliated. But look at the quartz grains, they are not much deformed. They are not showing, other than wavy extinction, they are not showing any other type of you know, deformation features. But uh, they are showing bell size deformment in some zones. And under thin section, these are the uh, pictures of the break shears uh, which are occurring on two sides of the gauze zone and uh, we have classified this as, as factor to chaotic break shear with the increasing nature of fixation and if you look at the mineralogy uh, the sandstone and the argillaceous sandstone they have a difference uh, both have feldspar uh, but the initial parasitic content in the delicious sandstone is uh, much more than the sandstone. But in the Gauss samples, <coughs> you can see that the parasitic proportion has increased much with, uh, with uh, lessening of quartz and repeat with lessening of feldspar and introduction of calcite mostly as veins in the quartz. And uh, if you look at the XRD data, uh, you can see that the argillaceous sandstone and the red gauge, they are the peaks of the clay minerals, they are almost matching. And in comparison, when we are placing sandstone, grey gauge and black gauge, uh, the XRD peaks are again very much similar. So from that, as well as uh, as well as from often there are instances that within the browse you are getting some intact rocks. But from both these observations, we concluded that mostly the grey gauze and red cows they have evolved from the sandstone uh, beds, and uh, it is for the red gauze it is the argillaceous sandstone from which uh, it has evolved. So now I will concentrate much on. Uh, the fabric of the uh, different uh, gauze samples because uh, we can decide for much from careful study of the fabric of the gauze samples. So here you can see in the first diagram, uh, these are the uh, red gauze uh, samples. So uh, under microscope you cannot see almost anything but when we are looking at it under ACM, you can see that the red gauze uh, it is actually it is caused with shear fractures. A network of shear fractures has developed, uh, breaking the gauze into rhombic pieces. And these individual rhombs, if we look at it with uh, slightly enlarged uh, observation, you can see that this, these rhombic pieces, they are again strongly foliated. And along their margins, you can see that uh, there are effects of pressure solutions in development. So, uh, essentially, the foliate red is foliated, 
and is overprinted with development of shear structures in conjugate set and with pressure solution and scene development. And this, when we are looking at this, this, uh, these fractures, if you look at them with higher magnification, we can see that uh, these fractures, they have different widths in uh, micrometries, but they are essentially showing a cataclastic pattern. Right. So the foliated drop, it has been with development of uh, fracturing, it is getting uh, developed in cataclasmic zones. And its thickness varies and it's along, there are sharp, sharp boundaries in some uh, areas. And in some areas you can see that the sharp boundaries, they have been again modified with development of pressure solution series. And it is not only uh, this, we can also see that this, uh, within this uh, shear fracture where, where they are slightly wider, you can see the cataclysmic fabric it is grading to a flow fabric. It is occurring along, uh, maybe along stripe, what I say, or across the width of the uh, zone as well. We are getting cataclysmic fabric which is being replaced with a flow fabric. So we have interpreted this that. Uh, after initial foliation development in the grounds, there have been cataclysmic structure development. Then again, uh, some form of sleep process and flowage has occurred, which are, which are changing these cataclysmic into foliated cataclysmic. And there are development of shear fractures on a finer scale. And these are the remnant blocks of the foliated uh, red grounds. And you can also see in this diagram that. These are calcite grains uh, which are developing along the uh, fracture walls. And if we look at it slightly in dark scale, we can see fat seal textures within these calcite grains indicating uh, fracture opening. Uh, and if we look at these calcites under uh, phosphorus, you can see a type 1 uh, deformation twins indicating. Uh, this information must be occurring somewhere around 170 to 180 degree or 160 to 180 degree days. Okay, so we can summarize the red cows fabric, the development of shear factors, then uh, shear fold development, random fabric of cataclysmic changing to polluted fabric, calcite draining along with fracturing, short vaccine texture, and again this. After draining, the calcite is again showing twin, that is, the deformation mode is again changing from cataclysmic to some uh, sleep process. So, this is about the red gauze fabric. So, when we look at the grey gauges, uh, it is from very fine scale to very entire scale. Everywhere it is a cataclysmic fabric, it is showing. And uh, the quartz grains, they are again highly irregular, possibly due to the showing effects of this solution. Right. So, in compared to the red cows, uh, these are thoroughly uh, cataclastic rocks, <coughs> and we are not, other than development of this solution, seems at places we are, we are not uh, looking at any uh, typical flow structures. Mm -hmm. of, uh, Flow processes within the gray uh, gauges. Now, if you look at the black gauges, which is a very really thin horizon, again you can see that the black gauges uh, it has developed a typical rhombic fracture patterns and fracture patterns of different orientations. We have we, 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 uh, we have interpreted as R1, P and Y shears and at the intersections of these uh, fracture zones where they are slightly wider and we are also going to a higher magnification, we can see that uh, from, uh, in comparison to the red cows, these, these, these uh, fracture bound zones of the black cows, they are also showing 
a catacausal fracture. It is not like the red curves where we see the foliated curve. So it is essentially catacausal rock. It is again making fracture the development of these concrete uh, fracture planes. And within these fractures zones, we can see that the extreme uh, gain grain size refinement. It is very difficult to measure what is actually the grain size. So we have labeled them as ultra catacrosites and places to maybe even uh, some form of uh, male generation because you can see uh, at the boundaries there are protrusion of this very fine material into the coarser uh, catacrosal zones. And these are again overprinted by development of the pressure solution seams. Uh, we can also find this flame like structure and injection like structures of these catacrosite or nail rocks within the <coughs> otherwise catacrostic fabric. Uh, also, uh, under very really high magnification, you can see some gas escape structures, a small uh, circular fabric, and development of clay crust indicates, which are also indicating a very fast slip, maybe uh, seismic slip. So, uh, according to fabric, uh, this is uh, something different uh, from the gray and uh, red curves that is becoming apparent. So we have again checked uh, what else is happening within these ultra cataclysmic uh, zones. Uh, so if you do EDS elemental mapping of these ultra cataclysmic bands, you can see from this uh, diagram that there is silica aluminium enrichment within these uh, ultra cataclysmic uh, zones, but uh, there is very significant less in cal uh, cal calcium which is present in the uh, in the matrix outside the calcite zones so these are this is a very interesting feature that we are losing calcite from these zones uh, and increasing SIA indicating that these are reduced to very fine K minerals and uh, if you look at the grain size distribution so black Crowds is essentially very fine grain. After cataclysmic bands, it is very difficult to uh, quantify them. So uh, you can see that there is a strong difference in grain size distribution from the red to the grey rows to the black rows. And if you look at the very fine fraction of the three grow samples, right? Uh, we can see in the 0.5 millimeter, less than 0.5 millimeter fraction, compared to the red and gray curves, there is a significant broadening of the uh, XRD peaks uh, at indicates presence of amorphous uh, materials. So it has been further checked with uh, TPM, and we can see this A in A is uh, showing a picture of the black clouds and this uh, red rectangle is the diagram C and the yellow rectangle is the, is the diagrams uh, these different where oxygen, silica, aluminum, potash, NG, FPC, quantum can be measured and the star this is the B so there are several such star zones uh, in the black cows, particularly the anthropotoclosite bands, where you can see from the diagram B that there is no, and the diffraction pattern indicates that there is no stability here. So this must be amorphous materials or molten materials occurring here. So uh, it is confirmed that the black cows, they have been melting with, with the using of calcite and enrichment of aluminium, silicate and other elements. So, so this is the characteristic of the black clouds that have been uh, studied. So from this we have inferred the evolutionary processes in the Raman zone that in the first stage uh, there is uh, deformation ensues and there is the fabric development uh, within the argillaceous 
a sandstone uh, that is uh, a little bit collision development then uh, texture cleaning starts and uh, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with just a position of the dust side rocks in the shear along the Nahan Trust. And uh, initially we are getting this fracture drug volume. Then with, uh, with narrowing of the fault zone, I have, I have drawn these ellipses to indicate whenever the active faulting is taking place. So initially this whole zone there was movement. Then it has been concentrated into a narrower zone where from fractured drops we are getting the big shaded drops. Then it has been further narrowed the fault zone. And we, uh, we are getting from the dexia, the gauze, the grey and black uh, red gauze they are developing. And essentially here uh, the dominant deformation mechanism is scattered classes and functional sliding which ultimately gave way to seismic slick with development of the black gauze and the principal sleep zone. Uh, and then again because we have observed that over uh, the in the red gauze zone or even in the black gauze there is again a effect of this solution. We have interpreted that after the seismic slip there has been again some seismic deformation. So in this way the Nahan thrust has evolved and uh, there are telltale evidences of uh, seismic slip from the Nahan thrust zone. And if we consider that there are those uh, black gauze that have shown you that they are really uh, they are really in the, uh, filled up with this development of those uh, anastomosing patterns of alpha cataclysmic bands. So if we consider that the alpha cataclysmic bands they are actually the slip surfaces and they are filled with uh, seismic slip then maybe uh, there have been intermediate uh, seismicity within the black cows and the mustic has been concentrated along this grey cows, red cows point. So we have proposed a model uh, where uh, it is a strongly literally dependent seismic slip uh, in the Nahal trust zone. But the entire deformation occurred uh, at a very shallow cluster level where we are dominantly getting only we are getting flow in the clay minerals and we are, on, we are, we are getting mostly cataclastic uh, fabric in the other uh, minerals present and as a result we are getting gauze and red shear type of rocks. Now I can I will shift to the other example which is the uh, North Carolina Trust. So it is occurring slightly at a deeper part of the Himalayan horizon. Uh, from the lesser Himalayan peak again. So for uh, Alimora, uh, this is the the right side is the map of the Kumail Himalaya after uh, Sivastava and Mitra. And here you can see this is the outcrop of the Alimora peak. So and the left side, this is slightly enlarged map which I have taken from Mondol et al. So this is the Nalmora Almora Tripe. So in the within the Almora Tripe you can see that it is bounded by two major thrust bands. Uh, the not in the north towards uh, south. Uh, and the South Almora Trust is a deep into the north. And within the Almora Tripe in the central this Almora Tripe it is still primarily fold, as you can see from the uh, section below. The entire peak is in front of the forehead. And in the central part, we are getting mostly metra in a sedimentary rocks, which are now have been cystose to very metal of the head. And it is called the Armada group of rocks. And the two sides of this Armada group of rocks, we are getting uh, a deformed granite of proterozoic age, uh, which is uh, colored green here. So. I will concentrate mostly on the North Almora Trust Zone and the fabric we are observing within the granite sheet. Okay. So, this is the general fold pattern within the Almora group of metasediments from small scale to very large scale. 
and these are again in the QPL pencil formula folder. These are going to be folded again. These are upright uh, folds. Now, uh, this is the map prepared by Sivasthava and Mitra, the north, north, the annual side of the North Armora Trust. So, you can see this line. Uh, this is the North Armora Trust as drawn by uh, Sivasthava and Mitra. So, in the equal side occurs uh, a equal side uh, which belongs to the Dhamta group. And in the hanging well side, this is essentially the granite. And again, uh, this part in the further south, this is the Almora group, let us say the Dhamta. So, in between the Dhamta group of rocks and the Almora group, let us say we have a very strongly deformed granite. And uh, they have systematically developed different varieties of shear rocks, which Shivasthava and Nikhil classic. I classified them as proto-myelonite, myelonite, and ultra myelonite. So, how they look like in the field? So, uh, this is the uh, proto uh, myelonite mm -hmm. formed from the original granites. And so, here we can see the large uh, crust and the foliated fabric within the rock. And above the North Amura thrust, the shear. Indicators they are indicating dominantly up to the south uh, shear within the protomyelonite, which is also evident uh, within the granite uh, myelonite. Uh, and the, uh, this is the ultra myelonite, and as I have shown you in the you know, earlier map, that as we progress towards the north and north thrust. The protomyelonite and myelonite they are changing over to ultramyelonite. And uh, to our observation, I don't know when this is not coming. Yes, uh, this is the this is a more cystos rock uh, which uh, we have termed as a pylonite. Right? So very near to the Almora Trust one, not Almora Trust one, uh, there are certain zones where a pyelonite development has been occurred and the rock has changed from ultramyelonite to pyelonite. So these are the three sections of the protomyelonite, the myelonite and ultramyelonite, which we are observing in the uh, Almora Trust zone. And uh, if you measure the phylo, uh, content of pyrosilicate minerals, so this zero means this is the north Almora thrust. So as we go away from the north Almora thrust, uh, the, you can see from this uh, diagram that the pyrosilicate concentration is much higher in the north Almora thrust. And it is getting, getting lesser and lesser as you go away from it. And with transivers, they conceive the reaction like this to which the potassium spur that is changing into muscovite and diatite uh, during deformation. So, this is the thin section of the phytomitic rocks, which is uh, essentially mica rich atomyelonites. And we are getting both uh, muscovite and diatite uh, from these rocks. So, this is again another uh, picture of these uh, phylonitic rocks, which are again, uh, which are and then showing some asymmetric things near the North Amara Trust. Now, uh, from the overall fabric, if you look at the individual minerals, uh, it is very characteristic that the face part, you see in A, and the face part, they are not showing much of the dynamic crystallization. Uh, they are essentially uh, failing to develop in the little uh, fractures. Uh, in contrast, the fact of words, they are showing uh, recrystallization uh, and dislocation uh, peak, uh, radiation, all sorts of dislocation uh, peak features. And uh, there is uh, crystallization of mica. And effect of pressure solution is also there. But how the mica have deformed, I will uh, discuss. So there is a uh, there is a uh, changing deformation style between quartz and feldspar, which is very common in uh, deformed rocks, uh, because you know from the very first diagram I showed 
that is for tactile it is from above 550 600 degrees centigrade uh, whereas uh, quads uh, show this type of degradation which is just starting from 200 degrees centigrade so we, uh, we are looking at some quad zone rocks uh, which are very close to the beauty tactile transition uh, because mostly the first parts are in a fracture, but at places they are showing some amount of uh, other processes as well. So this is the uh, fact in the Dolina style deformed uh, face by thrust and here they are showing the same same, same as the North Amara thrust. If you look at the quad uh, CQ pattern, in the same as uh, from the south pattern, you can uh, decipher from the um, uh, EBSD pattern. And the decrystallization, there is a, uh, uh, you know that from the types of decrystallization in quad, it is possible to estimate or have some idea about the deformation temperature. Uh, so mostly uh, over the, if you look at this diagram, mostly over the North Amara thrust and for its seismic uh, distance, it is entirely uh, dominated by subgrade uh, uh, rotation crystallization of quartz and essentially much away from the uh, transform you can see GBM type of crystallization. So in a way this has been also in a, this has been also studied by earlier paper by Sebastian and Mutra that there is an inverted thermal gradient in the banding outside of the North Amanda thrust, so very near to the thrust. We are in the 450 to 550 temperature zone and away from it we are getting back to higher temperature and possibly in the pyramid zone we are slightly at lower temperature. But there is no uh, definite cause to uh, comment about the exact temperature available with us. And other than the dissolution peak, this type of features are very common uh, over the North Armora thrust, the uh, fence parts. Uh, they are showing pressure development of pressure shadow zones where fine quartz and mica are crystallizing. So, this is another principal crystal which is showing such pressure shadow in zones, and some quartz screens also showing some development of pressure shadow zones in the myelonitic water myelonitic samples, which are very close to the North uh, Amara uh, trust. So our interpretation is that from the dissolution field regime with the new crystallization of the fiber silicates, the deformation mechanism is also changing from the dissolution field to a pressure solution field. And if you look at the micas, because it is very difficult how micas are deforming, so we have to look at, at the micas and the TL. You can see there are dislocation triangles developing with the micas. So if you do with the ST of the micro plane, you will see that it is essentially sleep on 001 basal plane of micros. And uh, in this diagram, you can see that uh, this is the sleep plane, 001 plane, and across it there are some fracture development, which are again getting folded uh, due to this uh, 001 parallel. So micas are essentially showing a combination of deflection with texture development and see. So in the summary, we can say uh, our, our interpretation is that and the deformation in the hanging wall of the Nata Martha, so we're getting uh, deformation uh, occurring in this uh, deformation range, which is what it is on the Essentially, it is from the south slip, and this formation mechanism is dominated by dislocation creep. But if we go to the north and the thrust, uh, there is uh, fluid, there must have been fluid in west with increasing mica content, isolation of mica along with this solution slip, which will be a fracture. So, uh, from from <coughs> from viscous flow, we get as we progress towards the thrust plane, we are going to uh, towards the frictional acid regime. So our interpretation at that in the North Armora thrust, we are looking at a much deeper part of the uh, earth section, 
by our web, uh, we are getting this functional uh, discuss transition journey section of this website. So, uh, in summary, this is the, the thing I wanted to present to show how uh, we have to study of polyphone blocks and uh, tell us a lot about the deformation process. And as you contrast your deformation process as we go from the outer part of the human origin to the interior parts. And uh, I will. Uh, this this uh, discussion is mostly concentrated uh, or have been taken from our paper uh, which uh, published in the uh, Indian Society of America. Uh, and these are um, uh, collaborators. So often I, during the talk, I say that we or uh, our work, that surely is a collaborative work. Uh, and uh, D.P. Sharkar is the first author who did PhD on this problem drugs uh, from the Hiroshima University and my collaborators are J.R. Rambo, Roshni Dash and Shankar uh, of my department, Dr. Shankar Bosch. He is also a collaborator in the Almora Park and Dr. Kajit Dashbutra of the U.S. College. He was a collaborator in the Nahan Park. And uh, at the last, Kulshik uh, uh, was very much uh, inclined uh, to be present in this meeting, but he could not be present uh, due to uh, some dire environment. So he, uh, he requested me to show uh, his message to the uh, forum that uh, the Lita and Shari Nisi are several different memories of discussion interaction with you. My thoughts are with you and with them. So, this is not only Koshi, but uh, the Koshi process message. I think this is all of our feeling uh, for our material issues. Uh, we will definitely uh, miss and uh, the discussions and his presence in all of our meetings. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ghosh. Uh, it's an excellent talk. So uh, may I now request uh, the audience to interact with uh, Professor uh, Ghosh and ask if you have any I, question. Should I stop sharing or I will remain it like this? Sir, you can keep that uh, on because okay. if someone yeah. refers to any slide. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any question? Let me start. At least to start the interaction. Yes, uh, Shantanuja, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Ghosh. It, it was an excellent talk. In fact, uh, I've learned many things from your talk today. So, uh, what has really uh, attract, uh, attracted me to think about, because you talked about different uh, color of gouges, uh, the gray, red, and black. And you have said, uh, uh, I think, uh, once that this black gouge shows melting. If I'm correct. Yes. 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 So, uh, uh, could you? Uh, did you uh, try to estimate the temperature of that melt, or do you relate this thing with the frictional heat of the strip? Uh, no, we could not estimate the temperature of melting, maybe, but we, we have visited with, with the shear duty and the sleep, seismic sleep, very fast rate of sleep. Because I showed you that uh, those CCA structures, and they, they have been experimentally shown that they, uh, they develop at a very fast uh, sleep rate, uh, which is akin to seismic sleep rate. So not only presence of okay. CCA structures, but also I showed you two TEM studies that uh, there have been uh, males in within the Atacus uh, so, sure. so, so those were uh, so, uh, so us, we think, that there must have been seismic sleep and melting, at least to some extent within this platform. Okay. Yeah. okay. 
So, uh, did, did you find any sort of, sort of pseudotechnolites there? No, no. But uh, I, I, I would like to mention that pseudotechnolites are not the only indicators of seismicity. So nowadays, people okay. have people have described many features. If, if we parallelly, you can refer to them as indicators of seismicity. No, no, no. Well, what I mean to say is no, that no, we have not found any similar no. no, okay. They are essentially ultra cataclysmic. At some parts, they are negative. Yeah. So maybe the negative parts you can say that they are similar but they are not true okay. similar How do you, how do you relate the uh, South Almora thrust and North Almora thrust itself? Type of folding or no? no so separate uh, two threads. Uh, I do not know really. I mean, in that, you know, can go through the paper by Sivasava and Nick, and there are a lot of other papers, and there are different models of the development of North Carolina Trust. In fact, if you could look uh, very closely at the uh, uh, map of Mondo later, right? Uh, can I show you this slide? Sure. Yes, this one. Uh, you can see that uh, Mondo little actually showed there are not two thrusts, but actually he showed there are four thrusts, right? And he, uh, what we, I am referring to as the North Almora thrust, he actually referred it to a, a continuation of the Ramgarh thrust, right? So there okay. is, uh, yeah. he, he described that the North Almora thrust is actually the thrust between the Almora group of rocks and the grand and the South Almora thrust same. So he, he they considered actually Mundo later through some other studies, you know, the, the Zarkon studies, they showed that the Almora group of rocks, they are actually the part of the higher animal and sequence, right? They have the typical okay. SMND uh, sorry, some geochemical signatures from that, they showed that uh, they are part of the uh, Hyrimalans, but this uh, this uh, granite it is really part of the Munshia deep thrust. So this is uh, okay. okay. So I have not gone into that detail. Really. I have only concentrated okay. on the constant parts. So uh, according to the map, so North Almura thrust, you call it as a back thrust. I think it's. Uh, I. Uh, not really, but some select. I think there are some people who are here, right? When well, they show that this North Armada thrust, if you go further northwest, it merges with the Tron's thrust. So they have described Tron's thrust uh, as the back as a back thrust, right? But uh, whoever worked in the North Armada thrust, we are not getting the sleep sense to be uh, not there, right? I have shown that. The North Almora but the North Almora deep, thrust is dipping towards deep, south. Towards south, but the sleep sense is dropped to the south. Okay, so the essential displacement so is dropped to the sense. south. Yes, normal sense appearing, but actually this is when there is uh, this sleep phase forming. So in Nape is uh, progressing in the uh, from the cold region, so it gets folded. So where they folded, the uh, possibly the south directed thrust. Orientation changes and it became uh, southerly dipping. So possibly uh, that could be one explanation. But it is not a normal fault, right? Though the sleep sense is like a normal fault, but possibly it is a folded thrust. What you Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. Uh, it's okay. an excellent talk. Any any further questions? Anyone from the audience? I will expect from uh, young people out here. I have just started. Sir, am I, sir, am I audible? Yes, Monosco, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, uh, sir, in the first part, you uh, showed a schematic presentation of six successive stages of deformation of the fault gauge formation and cataclysis in Brexia. So, uh, right. am, I, am, yeah, am I understanding it correctly that 
there are six subsequent stages of brittle deformation at the same brittle shear zone and the shear sense is also same for all the events uh, uh, if i understood Yes, sir. This one. This to this diagram. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, I mean, uh, this sequence, uh, I, I, uh, we tried to build up uh, from the fabric studies actually. When you see the red gauze, it is uh, foliated, but the grey gauze is uh, sorry, not not better not to call them gauze. Uh, the argillaceous sandstone is foliated, but the sand, uh, sandstone is not. Right. So initial deformation, it must some position development within the argillaceous sandstone, right? Uh, okay. Then, uh, then there have been fracturing and uh, uh, fracture drop volume, and then break shear, right? And then the gauze is at the central part. So uh, our interpretation is that progressive narrowing of the fault zone is occurring with cataclastic speed. Right, and which ultimately okay. leads to uh, this uh, uh, slip, a seismic slip along the and development of the black grouse along uh, this point. So this uh, okay. this uh, this is a progressive uh, sequence of evolution of the transform, but we have just shown it into several steps uh, as the texture of fabric, whatever we say, that is suggested. Okay. So, so uh, we, we we are not in a position to say when I, uh, the time also, right? When okay. So it can uh, can can it be in uh, one single event it or can, it is a one thing, but it could be repeated because I said that in the uh, in the black gulls, cataclysmic zone, they have they, they have developed in multiple numbers, right? Okay. So there yeah. could be multiple seismic speed, but we are not in a position because. We do not have any like, uh, any time constraint. We have not dated the clay minerals, right? If you could have, okay, okay. Then we might be able to say about the exact time frame of the problem. But that part could not be covered. Okay. okay. But it is possible okay. if you if you in a separate the clay particles from the cloud zones and you date them by some method, maybe uh, an argon, then you call from light is to meet it. Then it is possible. You can also have a time sequence here. But that could not be done here. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Yes. Any more questions? So if not, sir, I will I'll take the opportunity to ask one simple sure, question. Sure, sir, sure. Uh, okay. do you think that the thickness of the damage zone or the zone of intense fracturing depend on the uh, nature of the fault? It is, uh, uh, I mean, whether it is a thrust or a strike slip fault or a normal fault. Uh, it will be very difficult to answer, but what I have seen in the Himalaya region, I can say that uh, in the in the uh, in the Nahan thrust, it is a quite a thick zone of fault drops development. But if you go up, if you go closer to the NBT. Uh, you, you won't find any such a uh, thicker fault zone drop. There, uh, I have also studied some parts of the MBT in the in the same sector, uh, traverse, uh, but I failed to find any uh, fault zone drop. There is a sharp plane of dislocation across which there you can see edge difference only, right? But again, if you go further higher up. That is in the deeper part of the origin, like the armorial thrust. There you can see again the thrust zone for it is widening with a wider belt of fall zone. So I have started, uh, this is my observation. So there must be some control why uh, the, some of the thrust zones they are very narrow, while others are uh, decorated right. with wide volume of fall. Uh, it is a fundamental force. I don't know whether any credible answers are available or not. And again, with uh, thrust and strike slip, I really cannot comment because mostly I have studied the um, thrust zones of the Himalayan region. 
and also from the Picambrian terrains also. Mm -hmm. I have seen as major sites in zone, but there are also uh, some places I can see that the fault zone is really not almost marked by any fault rocks, but at other places it is quite thick to development of different kinds of fault rocks. So it, I think it is not really dependent upon uh, the mode of the fault. Zone. Must be some uh, other parameters that are controlling uh, what we do the breed of the fault. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So I think in few of time, uh, we uh, would like to conclude the meeting here. I'd like to thank... No, no, no. no? Okay. Hey, Jyotir, Jyotir, Jyotir Ma, Jyotir Ma. Yeah. We, have, we have here a person working in Nahan for okay. a considerable long time. Okay. We want to learn something also. So okay. I would request Professor Dilip Okopatai, sir. Okay. If you want okay. to... Sure, sure. If you, yeah. Sure. If your interactions will 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 gear up something, right? Right. We find something new. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I have worked in uh, Nahan Pinjor area for quite some time. We have a few pub publications also. One of my PhD student had worked in there. Uh, uh, I understand that your um, Nahan Thrust, the so-called Nahan Thrust, the name doesn't matter, Nahan Thrust, because uh, in our nomenclature it is not a Nahan Thrust, it is something else. Uh, but name, by, that's in a name, right? Dilip Mukhopadhyay or whatever. Uh, you showed that um, uh, it is very close to Pinjor, is that right? In, yes. in Kausala River section, is that right? Right. right. Uh, in Kausala River section, uh, on both hang, hanging wall and foot wall are um, Dagsai Kasoli rocks. It doesn't separate, it doesn't separate um, the Shivalik from, from the Paleogene rocks, Subhatu Dagsai Kasoli. That's number one. Number two, if you want to really look at uh, what happened during uh, coal thrust trail deformation, uh, Kausala River is not the right place. That is because uh, between MFT and MBT there are a large number of faults. There is a, is a thrust stacking wage type of thing. Uh, and if you want to separate out and want to see how it develops, uh, the microstructures develop, it is something near Nahan one has to come, because that's where the full thrust belt uh, is the maximum width. In Kausala River section it is, they are very tight, where the faults come so close to each other, one doesn't know which fault is one is dealing with. Uh, so uh, one should actually look at microstructures of uh, different faults uh, near Nahan somewhere because otherwise uh, one would not know which fault is uh, which one. Secondly, if you look at, if you go from MFT to um, Jutok Thrust, the whole sequence, you can, you can drive in one day to field work. Then you find that um, uh, MFT is essentially brittle, essentially brittle. And if you go to Jutok Thrust, there is some brittle, but it is mostly ductile, and it gradually changes, gradually changes. And the faults that you have at the surface right now, they come from different uh, levels, different depths. And they bring up the microstructure that form at the depth. And for all the faults, there is a brittle deformation superimposed on the ductile fabric, some of them. So uh, I would uh, tend to think that um, that um, uh, if you want to look at uh, microstructures and how it evolves through space and time, then one has to look at all the faults together. All the faults together. Nahan thrust, that the Kausalya river thrust, is not the thrust in the Himalayan fault thrust. 
it is one of the many thrusts in the human entity. On the sequential development of microstructure, it will it probably be throw some more light. Not that your work is any less significant or anything like that, because one has to look at one fault at a time. Uh, but if you look at uh, structures developing, microstructures developing in all the faults together, in a, in a sequence, uh, not together, but in a sequence, um, that might throw more light on it. Because the geometry, structural geometry of fault thrust belt in the Nahan Tuvatu um, area is extremely complex, extremely complex. And we have all published, so one can always look into it. Um, uh, so that's all I would like to say. It, it doesn't uh, diminish your contribution or your work or anything, but I would tend to think that uh, one should uh, one should look at uh, all the calls today. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I add something? Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Uh, I agree with uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay. Uh, I agree with Professor Mukhopadhyay uh, that it is uh, uh, it's very difficult. Mane, we took that as the Nahan thrust. The thrust we are getting just uh, below the pinned top, right? But uh, maybe the nomenclature of the form, different waters have different names used, right? That is one problem. So, but I. I use the term Nahan thrust uh, because I got it uh, some in some work. It has been labeled as Nahan thrust. So no, it doesn't work. matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. But I, I concentrated on that point because there have been some points in rocks, and in that area, just below pin the I showed you the twin uh, photograph that in the one side that boundary rock appears. Right? And in the hanging one side, if you go, we are getting the dark side. If you go to the Parvanu, then the Sumatu rocks are coming over the dark side uh, rocks. And if you go on up to the NVT, there are lots of slices of uh, the Sumatu dark side and Kasami they are coming. Uh, so I do not uh, comment on uh, what Professor the say, but my only uh, say is that uh, in the area where I studied, there were the Shivali golden beds. So maybe the Nahan thrust nomenclature could be different, but actually we started at a region where the size separates the shear. That is the thing I want to add. There is another thing that I would have uh, uh, Santanu's question that um, I thought I will ask that, and Santanu already asked it that you have black uh, gouge, uh, red gouge, and, uh, and uh, White gold, right? Gray gold. So, um, why the difference in color? I just could not understand what exactly you responded to. No, uh, different. Yeah. Different in color, uh, I, I also do not know really. I mean, why the different color? But uh, I showed you the field uh, photograph of uh, the dark side rocks. Uh, they are made up of alternate reddish colored argillaceous sandstone. And slightly whitish, blue colored uh, sandstone. Okay? So, if you develop the gauzes from these two types of rocks, uh, possibly the color is also coming from the original protein. Okay? Because originally, like, I, will I show the photograph again? Mm, it will be good. So this one, so uh, this is the Shiori boulder bed I was talking about, which is occurring very close to the football side. And uh, this is this is just one photograph. So these white parts, these are essentially avinetic sensitive, almost devoid of very little phylosilicate, but this reddish part, and this uh, what I have labeled as Argilicia sensitive. The original rock also have a color uh, difference like this. So maybe when they change into uh, gauze in the fall zone, uh, the color came from the original rocks. That could be one explanation. Yes, uh, the dark side rocks that um, mm -hmm. in that in this particular area, dark side yes. rocks, 
they have uh, if you drive from uh, nahan towards uh, west along the uh, road that connects to simla then you find there are excellent outcrops of dagsai rocks yes that's yes. dagsai and subatu rocks kasoli is very difficult to find on that road uh, now in dagsai rocks that you find we have a uh, whitish sandstone and reddish shale not exactly shale but a reddish shale reddish shale right so reddish shale will give you a red color gold right. uh, and uh, gray sandstone will give you gray color gold. but i am intrigued by that black one yes. black one white is black uh, white is black and uh, uh, did you find lot of carbon there graphite for example no not really not really we have done uh, exact analysis but not much of carbon in it but there is extreme grain size refinement so maybe if you uh, find it to a very extreme level it could Uh, look as if black. That should be one experiment. But there is not much carbon there. Yeah, but uh, we, you said that uh, we find that um, uh, there are pseudo tachylite, right? Black could be because of pseudo tachylite. Is that right? Could be. Not exactly pseudo tachylite, but it also is a correlation. But some type of melt, uh, melting has occurred. But you did not see any pseudo tachylite in your thin section. In, uh, yeah, it showed in the ultra uh, cataclysmic bands. They had some injection features, but they are extremely uh, thin, right? Not the pseudotechnite which we normally encounter, uh, which we can see with our naked eye. Because to see these things, we have to go uh, under SCM, Nebula's view. Uh, Otherwise, we cannot see them. Okay. I I I think I have earned my pension. Okay. Okay. Chaturmar, are you yeah, there? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sorry, any any sir. any further question? The last question for this evening. DM sir is still there. I think whether he can hear us or not to conclude things. No questions. No questions. Okay, sir. So you have enjoyed the talk, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. Jyotima, if all uh, right. Stop sir is, yes. Yes, yeah, sir. Sir is saying Thank something. You Thank you. So I think uh, this brings to the end of this particular meeting, and uh, we again pay up, uh, pay our deepest respect to Professor Dilip Shah, and uh, may his soul rest in peace. And uh, I'm sure many of uh, Uh, many of us will uh, carry on his legacies and carry out the uh, the wonderful work that he started uh, so with that note i wish to thank each one each every one of you to be here today also the family members of professor shah especially and i wish to extend my thanks to uh, professor ghosh as well for delivering this uh, uh, wonderful lecture so with that uh, i end this meeting for today and uh, uh, i will send the um, next meeting request very soon thank you very much thank you thank you thank you